Welcome to Using Vue with ASP.NET Core by Example. We're just going to get started. My name is Sean Wildermuth of Wilderminds. In this first module, we're going to take a brief look at web development both now and in the past. We'll look at why I think Vue is a good solution. I'll explain some of the basics of Vue. I'll show you how to get Vue into your project. So I get this question a lot when I talk to people, is web development broken? My view is that it's actually a pendulum. When the web started, it was simply servers just serving up HTML. It was just like giant documents that could be all interlinked. Then once we had several APIs in the browser, we could work with the DOM and such, and then someone found the XML HTTP request object that allowed us to interact with the server without having to go and refresh a whole page of HTML. This changed a lot in the way the web was built. Soon after, jQuery was brought in to remove the idea of the browsers as being different parts of the development story. And so instead of having to know about individual browsers, you could just write your code and hopefully it would work on most browsers. It wasn't 100%, but it was pretty close. Then a few years ago, the idea of single page applications changed the landscape again by focusing on these rich applications run directly in the browser, usually with their own idea of navigating through different pages or parts of an application. And we saw lots and lots of client development and that's still going on today. But in the last couple years, this has been changed with the introduction of things to try to better build these giant applications in the browser. We're doing that by using command line interfaces, loaders, transpilers, different languages that compile down to JavaScript. And it's made the actual development pretty complex. In fact, it's turned off a lot of different developers from wanting to stay on the web. This pendulum is from, oh, the web's not difficult, and then it's really difficult. And it's always with the sort of idea of making the browser more capable as an application platform. But what ends up happening is we scare away a number of developers that don't want to do the really difficult stuff every time they need to do something really simple. So if we look at the way the web was, let's say before single page applications, we had a problem. So we had jQuery code that was fairly simple and discreet and could do what we wanted in a pretty simple way. But this simple little bit of jQuery code to click on a button soon turned into this enormous amount of code that was really hard to test, really hard to maintain, and ultimately became these giant behemoths in the browser. Not that easy to read, and this code became fragile, and so people never wanted to touch it anymore. Oh, if I do this or I do that, everything's going to break. And so we have these old applications that just have tons and tons of this client-side code. In addition, we have the problem of what I call callback hell. I'm certainly not the only one that calls it that. But again, we start with this fairly simple interaction with, let's say, a button. But once we start wanting to do things like make requests to the server, get data to show it, or to go ahead and send data back to the server, we start getting into this deeply, deeply nested ret nest of callbacks. Now, being able to do the callbacks and work with asynchronous calls is certainly a good thing, but it becomes really hard to read and really hard to know exactly where you are in this stack. So the core ideas of what we need in the browser is this idea of scalable JavaScript. Being able to build these large applications in the browser using JavaScript, everyone has had their own little ideas on how to make that better. Microsoft and others came out with languages that compiled down to JavaScript so that you can get some of the benefits of a typed language or a type safe language at compile time. Other people built frameworks to try to make it simpler, but they were all somewhat opinionated. And so that sort of leaves us to where we're at today, where the two behemoths out there, React and Angular, end up being a big percentage of the projects that are built, even when they're not necessarily the best solution to those projects. These are both built to enable you to create things called SPAs or single page applications. So I have some strong opinions about the phrase SPA and what it actually means for most development. Single page applications are incredibly useful in many, many occasions. You can find them very commonly as monolithic enterprise apps. So have one giant app in the browser, you go to a single page, and then you have all this functionality in sort of the new version of the VB6 monolithic app, in my opinion. These can be consumer facing, but it's not typically. It's usually inside of an organization or from an organization to another group of that organization, or even sometimes enterprise to enterprise or company to company. 
Most of these want to replace the web navigation itself with something that does inter-page navigation. So navigating from one part of the application to the next, which is a good idea and is really useful. You don't want to necessarily have to navigate back to the server every time you want to display something new. It also wants to centralize these services so that getting data, holding on to data, handling how that data change is sent out to other parts of the application, all of this ends up being part of the larger story of single page applications. But we've come into a place where when I talk to users and students, they get the idea that everything has to be a spa. I think that spas are overused. Spa is actually a really great solution to forms over data, but that represents some percentage of the kind of applications that are written. Spas are also great for dashboards when you are dealing with a lot of data, even though you may not be navigating to different parts of a page. But using a crowbar to get a spa into your typical website just seems silly when all you need in some cases is validation of a form, or maybe you want sortability in a list of products or a list of items on a page, or you just want to have a simple grid of data that you want to be able to have some interactivity with without having to necessarily build the entire spa. So next, let's talk about how Vue wants to approach this idea. So several years ago, Evan Yu was an employee at Google and was using Angular for a lot of different applications. Now, let me be really clear. This course isn't meant to, and even my opinion isn't that Angular or React are necessarily bad. I want a tool that will allow me to scale up a little better than what Angular and Vue allow us to do. And this is exactly what Evan Yu was thinking about. He talked about wanting to take the things that were good about Angular, but build something that could be scaled up without a lot of the extra concepts that are involved. So let's see what this looks like. When you start to look at the anatomy of a typical app in React, your code is sitting on top of a compiler that's going to take the JSX part of that and then run it through a second compiler to convert the Babel into something that's ready for the browser and then Webpack to put it all together to have browser ready code. Angular is similar to this. They're using an AOT compiler and then Webpack to create these packages of browser-ready code. Now, using Webpack or other loaders or using compilers isn't necessarily a bad thing, but in order to do even the smallest application here, you need to understand a lot of concepts. In fact, the idea of building these command line interfaces or CLIs has been to try to hide some of that complexity. That complexity itself is more code that you have to actually deal with as a developer. And one of the reasons why I like to have an alternative here, when I'm not building a giant monolithic app like I would in Angular, or if I'm not building a highly componentized dashboard like I might in React, I wanted to have another option. And Vue simply takes your code, and your code is the code that's actually executed in the browser by default. You put in Vue.js, you put in your code, and it runs and does these smaller pieces that you might need in your application. I call this enhancing a website versus building a spa. Now, if you can gain the benefit of using things like TypeScript or ES6 compilers and Webpack and other loaders, you can add on to them, but they're not required. And that's the thing I like so much about Vue is that as you need the complexity as bringing in TypeScript or ES6 or ES2015 to gain the benefits of these extra levels of complexity, you can go ahead and do that, but you don't have to have it out of the box. If all I want to do is make my contact page, make sure that an email looks like an email, I can do that with Vue without having to take on all these different concepts. So what is Vue? It's a simple and minimal framework to small .js file, and it's built with the idea of being incremental so it can scale up. So again, if you just want to do some simple data binding or simple interactions with the user, you can use that out of the box by just dropping a JavaScript file on a page. It's just browser ready JavaScript as well. And I love it when a full spa is too much. And often I will start with a non-spa. And then if I need to scale up into a spa, Vue allows me to do that as well. And that's one of the things we'll do in the balance of this course. So when we talk about scales up, the idea here is that Vue itself wants to do as little as possible. It wants to just have its core competency being handling data binding and event handling in the browser. The sort of core competency of what it is good at. It doesn't do networking or validation or routing out of the box. It has a curated ecosystem, which we'll take a quick peek in, and that we'll utilize during this course to say when we need networking, instead of Vue rebuilding a whole networking ecosystem, they're just going to say, use whichever one you're most comfortable with. 
you want to use validation, there's a few different styles that may appeal to you and their ecosystem allows you to pick which ones make the most sense to you. And they have a routing component they've built that can bolt on the top of you to allow routing for building full spas as well. And this goes down the line with lots and lots of the other pieces. You're going to find that Vue on the whole isn't going to throw in the toolbox extra things that you need. So it is a different concept, whereas Angular tries to, you know, sort of be everything, you know, building the HTTP client module because it wants to handle things in sort of the Angular way. Vue is sort of the opposite. It says, I don't care how you're going to, let's say, make a network request, get data from the server or send data back. I'm just going to allow you to interact with the page when you get that data back or before you send it. Because it's so discrete, I do want to talk about what it's capable of. It supports declarative rendering, which is rendering via views, like you're probably used to in these other frameworks. It supports component-based composition, though components are not required in the simplest cases. It supports one- and two-way binding. Single-file components to allow you to build components in a simpler way. And it does support plugins, mix-ins, filters, etc. to extend what Vue actually does. So enough slides. Let's dive in and let me show you how to get Vue into your project next. So before we take a look at Vue and start working with it, I want to show you where we're starting from. This course is about using Vue in an ADO.NET Core application, though most of what we're going to be showing you might be applicable to other server-side technologies, Node, ASP.NET Classic, JSP, etc. I'm going to be using ASP.NET Core to really interact and talk about how it's going to work with this client-side component. So I will expect you to be somewhat familiar with it. If you've gotten the sample source code from the website, there is a set of before and after projects for each module. And this is how the before project looks for the first module. And this is where we're going to start and add to as we build out our application. This isn't an empty project by any means. It has API controllers for a number of things. For instance, products to go ahead and get products out of a sample database that this project will build for you. And it also has a root controller that handles just the handful of pages that we're going to actually need to deal with. All of the server side views we're going to be dealing with are here in the root. Again, there's only a handful of them. And we can find all the entities around the data including the actual entity classes we'll be working with, as well as the way we're getting the database with the store context, the DB context class, an initializer for creating that database, and a repository for working through into that database. For the most part, we're not going to write a lot of ASP.NET Core code. We're going to depend on these existing controllers to do most of the work for us. If we run this, just to show you what it looks like out of the box, we can see it's just a simple web page. We don't have products actually being shown yet, but we're just going to represent a simple store where people can buy things like groceries. We do have an about page and a contact page and won't be implemented in the course. You'll see it does have links over to the course information, but we're gonna be doing most of what we want here in the home page, as well as a page called underscore checkout. This will be another page we implement with Vue. So we're using NPM to get our client-side dependencies. And when we use these client-side dependencies, we're using a little trick in order to use them from our web pages. Now you'll see that the WW root doesn't have a lib or a vendor folder or whatever you want to call it. What we're actually doing is in the startup, we're configuring that when someone requests the lib folder, that we're going to actually get those dependencies from node modules. And this is a little trick so that we can use node modules as the raw folder for getting paths. So for instance, in our layout page, when we look at Ford Awesome or Bootstrap, we're looking for it in the lib folder, Bootstrap, Dist, etc. And that folder actually exists in node modules, Bootstrap, Dist, CSS. So the whole idea here is that we're going to use the node underscore modules and alias it as this lib folder. This way we can handle dependencies in a pretty simple way using NPM, and it'll just work without having to go ahead and write gulp scripts or maintain other complexities. Ultimately, when we want to deliver this to production in some ways, we'll probably want to do that because the node modules folder is going to end up being a lot bigger with a lot of other files we probably don't need. But for getting us into development, this will work pretty handily. So let's close all this for the moment. And in the next video, let's talk about how to actually get Vue. So let's go ahead and get Vue into our project. 
So if you go to the Vue.js.org website, you're going to find the root page of what is Vue. And we're going to start by just going to the Get Started button. The Why Vue.js will show you a video that sort of talks through that. But let's focus on the actual getting started because that will tell us a little bit about how to actually get it. In Vue, you can just drop us a single source of Vue.js directly into your project. But for us, we're going to actually go ahead and use a package manager, NPM, to get Vue in the version we want. So here in Visual Studio, if we go down to NPM or package.json, let's go ahead and just add a new Vue is the name of the project. And then the version is, and this version might be a little different, but it's going to be 2.5 point something probably as you're watching this course. And Visual Studio will go ahead and add that for you. Of course, if you're more familiar or comfortable with the command line, we could of course use npm install, save, view, and it would have done the same thing. It doesn't matter how you get it into the package.json, just important that you actually get it in there. And once we've added it, we can simply go to, let's say, our index page. And in our ASP.NET project, we've created a section called scripts, where we can inject scripts onto the layout page. If you haven't done this before or haven't done with ASP.NET much, the layout page is the container that all the other views are going to, for the most part, live in. And we've got two sections that we can optionally add on a page. One is head, in order to add things like CSS files. And there's a script section that will allow us to put scripts at the bottom of the page. So in our case, what we're going to want to do is actually create a script source. And this isn't going to give us IntelliSense because of our little trick with node modules. But you'll have to trust me on this. It's going to be lib view dist view.js, which is going to be the non-minified version. It's going to be the development version of that. And to just sort of show you what this is, since it might be unfamiliar to some of you, if we look at node modules, there will now be a view directory that has a dist folder. And then in the dist folder is the view.js. You'll see some other versions, like for loaders, there are versions that are for ESM and for common. And there's also a view.min that is the production ready version. So now that we have it on the page, we can do a couple of things. Instead of creating a new file quite yet, I'm just going to create some script on the page so we can see what this looks like. And what we're going to want to do is create a new instance of Vue. And Vue takes an object syntax. And the only thing we're really going to need to be able to specify is EL or the element that the Vue is going to be responsible for. This could be the whole page. This could be just the body. This could be some discrete form. Let's go ahead and just wrap all of this in a div, and I will call it index page. And then my EL is just going to be a selector for that. So pound index page means that I'm going to be responsible for all of this. That view itself is going to be looking at and trying to work with all of this as a discrete unit. And we can use these double curly braces that if you use some of the other libraries, you're probably familiar with now. And that will allow us to do arbitrary JavaScript effectively here. We're actually going to be using this for data binding to data on the view and such later. But in its most simple form, we can do new date get full year. And this is just the date API inside of JavaScript. We're not doing anything all that interesting yet. But if we go ahead and run this, we'll see that 2018 is now being spit out. This is just a one-way binding of data that we have in those curly braces and just spitting it out here. Now, at the very basic level, we can see that creating our view instance is doing is allowing us to execute JavaScript on the client side. Let's look at a real example to see how this would really be with data next by creating our first view. So we've done the briefest introduction into view. And I've talked to you about how to use it to enhance your websites, though I haven't really shown you how to do it yet. I've talked about how Vue can scale up to a spa, and that you just drop in a .js file and you can start coding. Now that I've introduced you to why Vue exists, in the next module we'll dig into actually making it work in a more traditional sense.